so the question was, how would you differentiate if um, now that the bar to get to use AI is so low, right? Um, so uh, to me, this is a huge problem um, uh, for everybody um, who cares about building a sustainable business. So like, th this is the crazy part to me is um, six months ago, a year ago, whatever, it was um, AI used to be a huge moat that everybody had, right? If you had the ability to do um, AI really well, that was like, like you know, you put it in your name. You, um, you, uh, that was the thing you tell everybody about. But now, like some of this stuff is, it's not that hard because it's so easy and so approachable. Like um, we, uh, we built our our integration in, in like 24 hours. Uh, um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of work to do to release these things, of course. But like, it just starts working quickly, and it starts to give you these tremendous answers very quickly. So for me, the answer is. You shouldn't, like small companies, and I'll give them this advice, don't think that AI is your, is your moat now. Like don't, don't be fooled into, oh, I, I've seen this before. If you can do really good AI, then you're gonna be awesome. You should have to have some other pitch that is um, for your customers, for your VCs, for, your, um, uh, for yourselves, because um, the, the AI is just too easy to replicate. And, it, and it's easy for the bigger companies, it's easy for the mid-sized companies, and it's easy for the small companies. So there'll be a lot of people who are all trying to do what you do. So in terms of like, I'm, I'm a big fan of competitive advantages, maybe you have a really deep understanding of your customer. Maybe you have really great design. Maybe you have a really, um, maybe you have some cornered some piece of, of the world of some piece of, con like the data that you have will still matter to just what you can apply it to the LLMs on top of. But, but like, um, uh, I, I think most small companies need to, to, to be thinking about this a lot. When you come to give a VC pitch or when you go to your customers, like, you, you can't just say AI. You have to say, and I wouldn't even start there. I'd say, this is what I do that's so valuable. And by the way, of course AI. Um, did you have anything? Uh, the only thing I'd add is I don't know that AI was ever like a competitive advantage. It was a capability that might have given some people a little bit of a head start, but the data underlying it is what I'd probably be looking for more than anything. Is there some unique data set that others can't have access to that the AI is able to train on in a unique and differentiated way? And then that's probably more of like a scale advantage, to be honest, or maybe you, you have some relationship to get data that others can't access. So AI is maybe up here, whereas your advantage is a few layers lower, I think. But I think it does, I think a lot of people have said, we've got a huge advantage because we've got AI and we've got these engineers and like that's been a thing, and that, that definitely goes away. But I don't think that was ever a hugely sustainable uh, advantage to begin with. I'm gonna pass it right back to you guys. But yeah, yeah. Uh, more now about like we have the technology and we have to figure out more use cases and what, what companies are going to be able to leverage this technology? Uh, very good question, um, which I'll paraphrase as, um, what might be coming next from the, the, um, the, uh, this area of technology? Um, so before GPT-4 came out, and, and before GPT-4 came out with the, um, the visual aspect of it, because you can see it can do images now, that was an obvious, the thing that was going to be really cool, when you could have it not just do basic text, but do text and video, to, or text and um, images and, and, and media together. Um, so I think um, the, the normal answer I would give you is, um, I don't know, and I don't know who knows. Um, like even the people at OpenAI, I'm not sure, like, like they have a, a complete uh, crystal ball in this. Partially because, like, I think right now, people are trying to understand what this, what the current stuff can do, like, and and it's, and, and, and um, some, sometimes they even make the models bigger, but they don't get better. Or sometimes they like prune them back, and they, they realize that they're like better off. Um, and so, um, to me, the the technology is very cool, but what you can do with it is maybe the the, the fundamental like next step question. And I think that that is it, like um, the green aliens, like. You got to figure out how to talk to them. Like, and, and, it, and it's just like again, like the people who build it often didn't know what it could do. Um, 
is, is, is my take on it. Uh, I guess if, I, if I'm trying to give you a technology answer, um, certainly the, the, there's so many people now looking at these and focusing on them that they'll probably come out with models that are more um, sophisticated in certain ways, um, who are tailored to different, and you'll kind of like pick amongst them. I think they're gonna build models that, are, um, that you can, you can um, train on top like today, you kind of just, like these things are frozen in time. You don't retrain. And I think we're even like maybe weeks or months away from uh, somebody, probably a big technology company, announcing that you can self-supervise train on a, on a bunch of content, um, which will be like a new way to customize these models. Instead of just giving it context or asking it, fine-tuning it, you can, like, here's a million something uh, docs or a million web pages or whatever of your own, like, like not on the internet training, and then you can, you can customize those. Those will be very interesting. I don't know if those are the game changers of, of like, like what we've seen up until now, but um, uh, I, I, uh, like anybody who tells you that they, they, they know, I would actually be suspicious of. Um, Do you think the cost is gonna go way down? Oh yeah, cost is a definitely um, a really interesting question. Um, so the, the thing that, that I'm very fascinated with is, is, and I just completely credit OpenAI is, they don't seem to be making a lot of money on this. Like the normal, the very normal thing you do is you're like, okay, my costs are here, I'm gonna get margin, I probably want like 50%, 80%, I'm gonna price it here. OpenAI is not doing that, like, or um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're not. They're pricing it very close to their, um, their costs. And that's just crazy because um, like, uh, uh, like you even saw, like they took chat to be uh, DaVinci 3, which was the, the, the traditional GPT-3 model, was two cents per thousand tokens, two cents per two pages of, doc, of, of, of text. And then they made a new awesome model and then they cut the price by 10x. And I'm pretty, I think they might actually be losing money on that. Um, but they're, 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 they're convinced that they'll bring it down. Um, and then that just throws into chaos everybody else who's working on large, large language models because they're, um, uh, they're uh, they had to compete with something that is like maybe losing money off off of. Um, so uh, like it, it's a crazy world. Uh, so will, will it go cheaper? Um, it, the, he, Sam Altman, the CEO of, of OpenAI, will say it'll almost certainly get way cheaper. Um, but it also the capabilities will almost certainly get better. And at the end, it might be more expensive. But you'll have something that's really powerful. And we just saw that in the last three weeks from the GPT 3.5 Turbo and then GPT 4, 30x price difference, and um, or 60 if you count the, the high um, scale ones. And then, and then now you just have to make a choice, and you get it. Like, and then I think you'll see more of those choices over time. You should you should call. Me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I heard two very interesting competing themes uh, in both thoughts. Uh, number one is. AI will kind of refine our current existing processes. Think of, you know, spell check when you're writing a document. Yeah. Another is we're going to see brand new, never before seen UX patterns. Yeah. Like, you get an email and then it pre-writes it for you, then you just swipe right or left. Mm -hmm. um, in your theory, do you think we're going to see more refinement or more novelty going forward with AI? I have a theory, I have an answer, but do you want to take this or? Uh, I'll, I'll give one a swing at it. So. Um, both, but I don't think you'll really notice the refinement because it's a refinement. So it'll feel very, you won't even, you won't even know that it got that much better. It just will. And we'll be super fascinated by the new novel things that happen, even if their broad applicability is low. You know, we'll be enamored by them. That's, that's my, that's my take. Um, so the, uh, the thought I have to, to your question is um, both also. Um, and the, the feedback that I give to our product team is um, some of them are like, what's the newest, coolest thing I can build that's so awesome and new? And, and um, we probably won like 10% of them thinking about that. Um, but the, um, the, the other piece, which is similar to Tom, Tom said, is like, at some point you should just use it to make your, your product better. Like, um, I think sometimes people, especially in Silicon Valley, forget that like, most people in the world when they use the products, they just want it to, do, to work well and be, and be nice. And, like, and it's not about like, the next generation, it's about just having a wonderful product and a wonderful user experience and a wonderful, like, people need to come back and use it. And, and so um, I think that you're gonna see a lot of getting better in small ways um, because it's just so approachable. Um, and then, um, but you'll, to the point, you'll probably notice the extra crazy new capabilities um, when they're out there. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, blue, um, yep, yep. Uh, all right, you, you mentioned the hallucination issue. Like you had mentioned confidence scores. Um, as I'm thinking about applications of this, one of the things I've been curious about is like to what extent we're all gonna need to be able to leverage human in the loop to be able to protect against the risk of hallucinations. What I'm curious about is if you've seen any companies that are already successfully 
auto automatically defining their own confidence scores when they're applying this in more specific use cases? Um, I, I, get, um, I haven't seen anybody do it specifically, but the, the, one of the key ways, and if anybody has any uh, feedback in the audience, uh, let me know. Um, but um, the, the thing that I've seen it works really well on is um, like it, the more that you ask it a general question with no context, the more you're going to get, likely going to get hallucinations. The more you can give it context in line, the more you're going to get it, and you got to tell it, right? You got to like, you program it. You're a helpful assistant, and here's the context. Only answer for sure. Like, like that's the way that you start to do these things. Um, and then, um, uh, and you see like Bing, if, I don't know if you guys have been playing with the Bing um, thing, it, it, it has the ability to quote its sources. And to me, that's absolutely critical to quote where you get the data from, where possible. Um, and then also, um, I haven't seen anybody do this yet, but we, uh, we've been doing it for some of our testing, is to just use all the language models to ask each other what they think. If, if you take a language model and you produce output and then you ask that same model like how, um, how good is it? It, it? it doesn't know that it's wrong. But if you ask another one what they think about it, sometimes they'll give you feedback on like, that's wrong for this reason. So like, um, it's a very expensive way to do this kind of uh, uh, test. But I wonder if there's going to be uh, companies emerge that do this, where they like sort of, um, you know, there's so many models out there, like that just gets the sort of the result set and then, and then uh, of, of those. So, um, but, but in general, um, for some, some applications, it's it is, it is quite hard to know um, when they're hallucinating. Actually, do you have any, any feedback? Oh, I was just going to make one other comment, which is in traditional machine learning, you're definitely going to see a confidence score depending on the models that are actually run, whereas with the LLMs, I think it's still a bit of a white box right now. So mm -hmm. it'd be good to see it, for sure. Do you want to introduce yourself? And just uh, the... Yeah, my name's Dave. So I work for a company called MindsDB. I had a question for you, actually. So, okay. Um, one of the limitations uh, on a lot of the LLMs is that they the foundational models have actually been trained in English. Mm. What's your thought mm. about, you know, proprietary, Open AI versus Hugging Face, open source. Um, in, in general, the thoughts. On, so my general thoughts are that I love the fact that this new wonderful technology that just blew all our minds came out uh, November thirtieth, and then already is completely commoditized, open source, available in fifty different ways, and um, and, uh, and and so cheap. Um, so that. In general, um, it sort of has gone through a full cycle um, so fast, like again, faster than I've, I've seen in so many ways. Um, the, uh, the, the point you made, I'm not an expert on, but, but it clearly is way better at, um, at uh, English, uh, Latin characters. Um, uh, and so I think you can ask it questions in, in any language, and it's pretty good, but it's, the output is significantly worse in other languages. So I assume that uh, right now there's a whole bunch of people who are working on solving this problem, um, both from the big companies, and especially them that are uh, companies that are based in other uh, countries where it's, the output's uh, bad. But then also I suspect that everybody who offers one of these will very quickly fix that problem um, because it's just uh, it's a it's a data set problem, and they'll just be working on getting mm -hmm. uh, new data. Um, so that's my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, you're, I'm going to give you an answer, and I will just quickly note that uh, there's a lot of people who know more than me, including anybody in the audience. But so, so, but the general the answer that I think that um, that I have is um, so. In, in terms of how we get cheaper, and in terms of why we get cheaper, um, I, I, I think the more that you can have, like the. Right now, GPUs are pretty good at this stuff, right? Because they have the ability to do the, the mass amount of calculations at the same time. Um, but then if, um, uh, but you can keep, keep going further. You can go further at the level of the chips, right? Like, like the same way that, like, I think you referenced um, crypto mining, right? Like, over time, like, if you start out crypto mining with, a, like, a certain GPU, and then you, it, like, oh, that, that's hardware now. They made, they made more customized chips. And, and some companies have been doing this for a while. Like, Google's pretty good at this. They have their, their special, um, uh, I forgot the name, the T, the T variant. What was that? The, the and AC. A AC. AC? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and, um, and so so people will, I think, because there's such a huge demand, I, I hope they take all those horrible um, crypto mining uh, uh, GPUs and like repurpose them to, to do something more useful. Um, but but um, but they'll run out soon. Um, and, and I do believe right now there's like a, like everybody's trying to secure their their um, their uh, uh, the silicon right to make this work. Like even even see like I think today there's the the, the a report that like even at, at Microsoft. 
their internal teams can't get access to use enough um, of the of the um, uh, uh, the AI capabilities because there's just not enough. Even Azure, you know, in all its glory, it, there's not enough. Um, and so, um, and, and I think you see like the large, like AWS or GCP, they all can have the ability to make their own specialized hardware. And I think they're just going to get way better. That's going to be one reason that it, the cost goes down. The second reason, if you're just asking my opinion, is because in these huge large language models that have all these hundreds of billions of parameters, I think a lot of them like aren't necessary. And I think they did that. Uh, I don't. Um, I gotta finish all the reading all papers, but like you can you can just like trim off and like learn which of the the parts of the, the like almost in, in your brain you know you kind of think of it like you're not always using all your brain and some of it you use a lot less okay well trim that out see what happens and I think that this is partly how you get the, the large language models that are trimmed even some of the newer technologies that might come out later they'll let you like use it for a while and then say trim the stuff and then it will be dramatically cheaper because it'll be It'll, it'll spend less time like calculating things that won't matter. But today, I think a lot of the, the, the GPUs are spent calculating things that don't actually come into the final result. Um, and so um, I suspect as that technology, and there's already like new research topics on this. And like, so those things will drive down the cost by orders of magnitude. Um, I, I, the, the thing that I'm personally cautious of is like, I think it's already been driven down by orders of magnitude because OpenAI decided to do that ahead of time. Hmm. And then now, so it'll be like, oh man, it's 10x cheaper. Now they're not losing money. Like, uh, like and, and, and so that's the, the key. And then, and then somewhere along the way, somebody's gonna want margin, be it, GCP, Azure, or somebody, and then and then so they'll start like as it gets cheaper and cheaper. I I personally don't know how much de like lower can go until some major vendor says screw it, I don't want money, and maybe that's gonna be OpenAI again. But um, who knows? So besides hallucinations, we know that uh, AI can also lie and it can also be used by you know, bad actors to do things. So I'm kind of curious about kind of your thoughts around you know having guardrails or if. Yeah. Yeah, points that are so, yeah, for me, the um, like uh, I, I forget what years was when Microsoft first released their large language model, uh, sort of early variant that was like very inappropriate. Like, I um, mean, people very quickly figured that out. Like, and then so like this is I think like people will say like this is one reason that Google didn't release all their cool technology that they have is because they're scared of what it, of like making it like um, uh, people misusing it. And, and, and OpenAI again like fix this very well. Um, and, but like I see today, like um, like uh, when I'm looking at the new technologies that aren't quite released yet, like they have these scores. And like like I had to reject. I'm doing enterprise class use cases on enterprise documents, and then I'm I'm like um, asking it very appropriate business questions. And every once in a while, it'll be like, um, especially the newer ones, are like, I'm sorry, this is inappropriate. Or, this is too toxic. Or, they have these like scores that come with it. I think they're way over worried about this kind of stuff um, from the models I've seen. But a key point is, is what, it was like, fine, don't use it. it. Go find an open source model. Go find one of the ones that fits onto your, your, your laptop these days from, from Meta. Go find one that's like, like and, and so then, like, like, there's no monopoly right now on this technology. OpenAI is awesome because it's awesome. Uh, other people will release it soon, but then you don't even need them. You can just do it yourself. So to me, it's gonna break through that boundary. Like, there's no centralized authority who will make sure that it's good. There'll be good ones, like the, the you know, OpenAI and Google and everybody else, but like, uh, like that's not gonna stop anybody who wants to be inappropriate or who wants to be uh, asking it to create really good, um, uh, you know, like uh, uh, fake emails to like scam people or whatever the, the use case is there. Um, does that answer your question? It does, yeah. Uh, did you wanna add something? Well, I was gonna say, what's your thoughts on Microsoft buying their entire AI ethics team recently? I didn't see that. Uh, that's, yeah. that's the problem. Yeah, it, it is really interesting to see how, um, uh, how well OpenAI did with the technology that was published in 2017, um, and suddenly they made it work. And then, and, then, and, then, and then Microsoft, who's amazingly moving quickly in all this stuff, is, um, they seem to be their thing was to be very close to OpenAI. And, and you know, they didn't build it, right? Like the OpenAI did. Um, and I, I could understand why OpenAI would want to start very conservatively. So, if what Ben's saying is true, which is they put a bunch of guardrails on and they made it too conservative, I can understand that because uh, public sentiment is in some ways like an existential thing for them. So if they, if they have one or two really bad instances and everyone sours on and they get a bunch of bad publicity, like all of a sudden usage goes way down. So in some ways it's almost easier to put the guardrails like really tight and then over time loosen them than it is to go the other direction. Um, 
because of the public sentiment piece.